This is my confession. It all started with the local jocks. Those pompous asses with their fucking football jackets and their cars paid with daddy's money. I hated them. So much. I wasn't even one of their targets. I wasn't one of the nerds. I didn't have any disability. and never belonged to any specific clique. I was normal. Or, at least I tried really hard to appear that way. You can get away with anything when you're a regular kid. At school, the air was still tense. It had been six months since Megan disappeared, and there were posters around plastered on every hallway. I did feel guilty about what happened to her, but business is business. The money was just too good, and if I ever woke up thinking of her, I'd just tell myself, you're just a middleman, that's what you are, just a middleman, and right now you're not even that. Right now, you're just Pete. Everyone called me Pete, and everyone called me a friend. What they didn't know about me is that it's all a farce. Pete's my name, sure, but over the last few years it's become more of a character. Pete is my shield. It's the thing that keeps me safe. During the day, I wear Pete's outfit and his winning smile to school. I volunteer to help out in the afternoons. I even go to church with my grandma every Sunday. But when I come home, I remove the Pete outfit and I can truly be myself once I open up my laptop. It takes a lot of know-how to do what I do, so I'll spare you the details. But I'm sure that at some point you've heard of this dark web, this whole section of the internet that you can't access without regular means. Since people can't access it normally, it's become a hub of illegal activity. While some users get in there only because they value their privacy, many others do it for far more nefarious purposes. And this is how the world works. There's a need, so the market finds a way to fulfill that need. I began that night pretty late. Pete was, I mean, I was invited to a party, so I had to go. I kept to myself, speaking to a group of people, when one of the jocks Mike took me to the side with a beer in his hand. Hey, Pete, my man! He wasn't slurring his words just yet, but he had been drinking. I could feel it in his breath. He had his arm around my shoulders as if we were lifelong friends. I awkwardly got myself freed from him. Hey, Mike, how are you? I tried in a calm tone of voice. Had he been sober, he would have caught the annoyance in my voice. Hey, I'm cool, I'm cool. So, listen, I hear you're like good with computers and shit. I was. It was one of Pete's hobbies. He had to be known for something, so that's what I was. A computer guy, who dressed well enough not to be called a nerd. So, there's this party I'm throwing at my house next week. You're invited, by the way. Great. Another one of these. And we're looking to score something really special, you know what I'm saying? Of course, everyone knew that Mike and all the players in the football team were massive junkies. How they were never caught with one of those surprise urine tests is beyond me. I nodded and he continued. Thing is, my dealer's out of town and I need to get something ASAP. And I heard you may know a guy who's into some shit. The way he said that gave me pause. What does he know? If there were any insecurities, I managed to keep them from showing on my face. I tried to deflect. Hey man, I have no idea what you mean. I'm the guy you call if your printer's broken. What does this have to do with getting, you know, stuff for the party? He looked at me and said, I heard you know about the dark web. You can access it. I know there's all sorts of stuff there and I was hoping you could help a friend out. Since when are we friends? I nearly asked. At that moment, I was going to make an excuse and leave. But then, I thought, Mike is rich, his family's loaded, and I did hear those rumors. I think he's into some shit too. Plus... He's an ass. It'd be fun to take him down a peg. Okay, so uh, here's the thing. I don't know anything about that really, but I may know a guy who knows a guy. I'll ask around and if they're up for it, they'll reach out to you, I said. Mike's eyes lit up and he smiled. His cheeks were redder now. That's my man! He patted me on the back and went back with his people. Later that night, I returned home and fired up my system. Have you heard of those dark web mystery boxes? Those are fake. The real dark web is a lot worse than something you'll see on some YouTube channel. Far, far worse. And I should know, because that's how I earn my living. I can put you in contact with dealers of any substance. Illegal weapons, contract killing, you name it. You pay me, and I keep the money safe until you get the service. Then I send the payment to your seller, and everyone's happy. All I ask is 10% of the transaction. It may not sound like a lot, but earning the web's trust is difficult, and I'm a man of my word. I made hundreds of thousands of dollars in all sorts of digital currency. If all goes well, by the time I'm 18, I'll be a millionaire. 
I reached out to Mike via email. He answered asking me how I got his info, and I said he shouldn't worry about that. I asked what he was trying to score, and he said he was looking for psychedelic mushrooms, a particular kind that you can't get in the US that would be expensive. But, as always, I know a guy. I reached out to the seller. They gave me the price and I got back to Mike, explaining everything. He sent the money, even though the price was very steep. The seller got to work. Mike sent one last email, asking me to let Pete know he should deliver the goods himself to the party on Friday. I was sure to let him know that this would not happen. He seemed upset by it, but the transaction still went through. Mike had been stupid enough to use his school email for this. Jocks are not very smart, I suspect and having his email address allowed me to mine for some of his personal information. Now, he had a purchase of an illegal substance tied to his school ID. I had broken into the school database a million times, so collecting all his info and tying him to the purchase was easy. Not even all of daddy's lawyers could help him. I spent the rest of the week putting everything together in a single encrypted file, which I'd send to the FBI anonymously, along with the key to decrypt it. But I noticed strange behavior on my computer. Files were in places where I never put them, my system would randomly freeze, and several times it crashed for no reason, forcing a reboot. That Friday, I woke up to a message in my inbox. We know, it said. A chill ran down my spine. The only thing I could think to do was to move all my crypto to an external drive and take that with me somewhere safe. I disconnected the whole system and took it to my car. I drove around the inner city until dark, when I found a homeless encampment. Some of the homeless were warming their hands to a fire that raged inside a can. I went in and dropped my laptop and the rest of my equipment into the pyre. When I drove home, I saw them from a distance. Several black vans, red and blue lights, and men with FBI coats coming in and out of my house. I was too late. I drove away as fast as I could, my mind racing, asking myself how the fuck they were able to catch me. I'd been so careful. My phone rang. Unknown number. As a rule, I never answered my phone, but curiosity got the better of me. I needed to know. Hey, Pete. It was Mike. His voice was different now. Cold. Calculating. But he also seemed to be enjoying himself. What the fuck? He interrupted me. She was my girl, Pete. And you fucking sold her out to some asshole half a world away. Like she was a product on a shelf. How does he know? No, no I didn't. What the fuck is happening, Mike? I asked. He just laughed. You're getting what's coming to you, you sick fuck. He said. I've been working with the cops for months. When Megan went missing, the feds began investigating everyone at the school, and apparently they found some odd traffic in your house. All they needed was a way in, and that's when they approached me. I begged them to let me help, actually. My heart was about to explode in my chest. I was gasping for breath as I stepped on the gas, and began to drive faster and faster. I have no idea what's happening! I shouted, but Mike just laughed. They've got it all, Pete. When you wrote to me to make the sale, you were actually talking to an agent. I have no idea how they did it. They got into your system. They got it all. I'm not buying your act anymore, Pete. By tomorrow morning, everyone at school will know the kind of monster you are. He said bitterly and hung up. The truth is, I did know what had happened to Megan. There was an interested party overseas, trying to get their hands on a young white girl. I never asked what for, but I imagine it wasn't pleasant. And I really hated Megan and her friends. She was very pretty, so when I showed pictures to the buyer, he immediately sent the payment. I got a local crew to do the job, and I scored a nice payday. I kept driving, until a patrol saw me and began chasing me. I managed to keep some distance between us, but soon I heard the helicopter above, and before I knew it, I was headed straight for a police barricade. I crashed into it, and immediately lost consciousness. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed, completely restrained, and there were cops in the room. They interrogated me, and I asked for a lawyer. I was told my family wouldn't pay for one. My mother was in shock, and my father was furious. They hadn't told my grandma about it, afraid that she would take the news badly, and that her heart wouldn't be able to take it. So, this is why I've written this small account of the facts. I'll accept whatever fate awaits me at the trial. Probably life, but we'll see. If it means anything, I do regret what happened with Megan. Maybe she didn't deserve it. Maybe she did. But I guess what hurts most is knowing that now, everyone sees Pete for the sham that he was. The charming kid persona hiding something darker beneath. I'll miss Pete. He was a good kid. I come from a small mining town in Arizona where there is not a lot to do except hike. It was a good but boring area to grow up. 
Our population was small with little to no crime. My father owned the quarry where a majority of the community's economic strain came from. He left me with a sizable inheritance after he passed away. I bought a truck and a house out in the plains with a basketball court and a pool. That was the sole extent of my lavish spending, but it was all I needed. Unless you count pizza. I don't have many vices to blow my fortune on. I've never been an avid party goer, luckily. Like a lot of people my age, one indulgence I did have was watching YouTube. Urban exploration became a most searched category of mine from 2009 on. I became a subscriber of a content creator and urbex vlogger named Isolation Infinity. He kept himself anonymous and did not show his face. He used footage of the haunts he went into as captured by the body camera strapped to his chest. His voice's baritone became a signature element of the channel. He traveled all over the world and went into many chilling places. These included vacant hospitals, asylums, morgues, and train stations. He even stumbled upon a murder in progress once. A homeless man had stomped another transient to death in a farmhouse. He uploaded edited parts of it. This was a controversial decision. It almost resulted in a lifetime ban for him from the platform. The clips did not help law enforcement later on, nonetheless. He was also arrested a few times for trespassing on famous estates. The Houdini Mansion in Los Angeles was one of them, but none of his fans held this against him. We respected him for being willing to get into trouble with the law in pursuit of the next viral video. Late last year, Isolation Infinity announced that he was going to have a live face review. It was only going to be for his patrons, i.e. those who gave money to his Patreon account. I contributed funds to it on a monthly basis. I viewed him as a pioneer of his entertainment niche and did not mind sparing a little change. He emailed me and told me I was one of a dozen allowed to attend the live event. He further stated it would be in a password protected chat room. He also promised an exclusive video which would not make it onto the public video lineup. I was more interested in the latter than the former. I never cared what his appearance was since I already had a vision of someone my age in their mid to late 20s. It was hard to convince me he looked any different from the picture in my mind's eye. Still, I was not going to turn down the chance to find out. Being able to brag to his diehard followers who did not get to experience it would be worth it alone. The night of the scheduled face reveal, I booted up my PC. I kicked back on a lounge chair in the second story room of my house, which was my entertainment space. It was complete with the video game consoles and my beloved Alienware computer, an open bag of pepper jerky and a bottle of ginger ale set next to my keyboard. I went into my email, the password was in my inbox. I followed the link, it led me to the video of a room with nothing in it but a red wall with a baby blue frame. The caption isolation infinity will be on shortly rested at the bottom of the screen. I expected a home studio and instead got what appeared to be someone's dingy basement in need of a new coat of paint. What bothered me the most was the sound of heavy machinery whirring in the background. I wrote it off as bad plumbing. A man came into the frame. He was slim and wore a trench coat with maroon buttons on its front. He reached down, grabbed the lens of the camera, and shifted it upward. The familiar voice we had all grown fond of started to count down. Are you ready to see who I am? Isolation Infinity asked. One, two, three, four... At five, he hosted it upwards and pointed it at his face. I froze. He looked nothing like what I had visualized. He was hairless, emaciated, pale, and had marble black eyes. He reminded me of Werner Krauss from the old German 1920 film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. His mouth hung open and tilted to the side as if he could not control the movement of his jaw. The most alarming thing to me was not how his features were not flattering, that explained why he valued being off camera for most of his career. What upset me the most in the beginning was how the disparity in his perceived age made me feel lied to. He always told his fans he was a young man, like most of his demographic. The individual before me on the screen was in his 50s at the earliest. I have been fantasizing about broadcasting this for a long time, he said as he licked his lips. You have made this possible, and so I need to show my appreciation by giving thanks in the most sincere way I know how. He moved the camera to the left, and I could not believe what I saw. A woman in her 30s sat on a grimy floor, her head down from evident exhaustion. Rusted chains circled her arms. She wore a tattered black top as though someone's knife or nails had left wounds on portions of her torso. Stains were on her clothes. She had spent time in the dirt fighting someone or clawing her way out of a soiled embankment before this. Say something, he ordered her. Tell them you can't wait to die. 
The blades of a chainsaw came into view and its motor revved. She whimpered with pain, and when she tried to murmur something, I saw blood drip from her mouth. I dragged the mouse cursor over to the right hand side of the screen to see how many people were in the chat. The answer I received left me weak. No one else was there but me. The others had either left or were never there to begin with, and I was too stupid to notice until then. My heartbeat increased as I tried to close the window out. I could not. The X symbol on the right hand side was visible but useless. It was like every virus infected pop-up ad you could not escape from. What? Infinity Isolation asked. You don't like it, Mark? Everything I do is to make my most devoted subscribers happy. A chill ran through me. He knew my name. It took me a second to realize he had gotten it through my membership to his Patreon. The fact that he was aware of how I was his only viewer worried me. Was I going to be the sole witness to a barbaric act of murder? Calm down, I reassured myself. This is an elaborate prank he's recording right now. He's wearing scary Hollywood makeup and she's an actress. This is all for the sake of getting more views. The chainsaw has to be a prop bought off Etsy.com. Still, my hand inched towards the phone to call 911. The way the woman expressed her misery in the moment was all too convincing. I held my device closer to my ear. I wouldn't do that if I was you, Mark. He stared right at the screen for a moment, his eyes making perfect contact with mine. Can he see me? He lifted the chainsaw above the woman's head. He brought it down with a noise from his throat which sounded like a cross between a scream and a laugh. A fountain of gore spurted out. The lens got hit with crimson bubbles. He cackled as I unplugged my monitor. I carried it downstairs to my car and drove to the nearest police station. I filled out an incident report in an office with a dying lamp and the scowl of a detective facing me. He looked as though he would have rather been anywhere else but at work. For the first two hours there, I had to convince them that I was not a crazy person. They thought I was there to waste their time with a fanciful tale of my correspondence with some creep. I hope it was all a hoax, I said. If this is not real, no one would be happier about it than me. Here's my computer. See if you can't trace where he's at in case... it... I gagged before I could complete my thought. The idea of it being authentic was overwhelming. They had cyber crimes go over everything, and a few days later I got my PC back. It took about a week before I received a call from someone working the case. She was a homicide investigator named Samantha Brown. We found the killer was streaming from a bunker in Virginia, she said. It's an old fallout shelter abandoned since the Cold War. He calls himself the I-73 Butcher, since that highway is his preferred route. He uses it as a screen name on the dark web. Infinity Isolation is a serial killer? I asked, feeling a knot in my stomach. No, she said. The real Isolation Infinity is someone else. This maniac poses as famous people. He uses a combination of tools including voice altering software and encrypted Wi-Fi. He hacks into their accounts. He gets a thrill out of making complete strangers watch his acts of terror. His tech savvy ways also allows him to control other people's webcams and we don't know how many he has breached. He is on several most wanted lists of different agencies. We have never found out what he looks like. The faces he uses on those terrible live streams are prosthetic. He has maintained a stringent anonymity and avoided the news cycle. I'm sorry you saw such torment. The good part is you turning in your computer helped us at least find out his last known whereabouts. The scene searched and we have some evidence. He's still out there somewhere? For now. I went to bed that night with a host of emotions. I felt violated by a complete monster that sabotaged my privacy. Moreover, I felt dumb for getting swindled. I still feel shivers over the fact that he is not apprehended. Word of what happened got to the real isolation infinity, who as of late, deleted his entire channel. Many speculated on how victims mistaking him for an insane person protrubed him. Sometimes as I lay my head down and drift off to sleep, I hear a noise by my window. I jump up and think it's a chainsaw. Thus far, it has been a neighbor's lawnmower every time. I hope it stays that way. I lost my left eye when I was only seven years old. It was a stupid way to lose an eye. 
But luckily, most people tend not to ask how I lost it. I think the majority worry it might be insensitive. It's not a story I like to tell. Not because it's upsetting or brings back bad memories. I just feel embarrassed by it. Growing up, my brother and I were obsessed with Robin Hood, the outlaw of Sherwood Forest, who would take from the rich and give to the poor. I'm not going to pretend this heroic savior of the poor was our hero because of his good deeds. We simply liked him because of his legendary skill with a bow and arrow. Our father, a keen gardener, had lots of bamboo sticks all piled up beside the shed which he would tie plants to in order to stop them from drooping when they grew. It was my brother's idea to take one and attach a length of string to both ends to create a bow. I thought he was an absolute genius. When we had finished making the bow, we made an arrow simply by using a handsaw to carve a small groove into one end of an arrow-sized piece of bamboo, which would act as a nest for the string to sit. I'm first, my brother said. No, I cried. It was my idea, so I get to shoot first, and that was that. At one end of the garden, there was a little wall which surrounded one of my father's flower patches. Upon the wall, we placed an empty plastic bottle to be used as our target. My brother, of course, then took the first turn, missing wildly and falling far short of the bottle on the wall. Next, it was my go and I also missed. It took about an hour before we both had knocked the bottle off the wall once. Right, now you stand in the middle and I'll shoot over your head at the target. Another genius idea by my brother. I didn't argue. I thought it was a cool thing to do, and if I did it, then my brother would have to let me have a go shooting over him. I don't believe he meant to do it. It was just a careless accident, but the arrow never made it past my body. It struck me hard and deep in my left eye. Straight away, blood poured down my cheek and I screamed in agony. I spent a couple days in the hospital before doctors decided they would have to remove what was left of my eye. Until I was 12, I wore an eye patch, but when I moved into secondary school, I decided to get my first glass eye to try and put an end to the pirate jokes. It might sound weird, but I loved my glass eye, and by the time I was 16 and leaving school, I had collected dozens, all different colors and designs. My missing eye stopped being something I tried to hide, and in a strange way, became my kind of signature. Kids would say, have you seen the boy with a spiral in his eye? Or, have you seen the lad with an eye like a cat? I enjoyed this. It allowed me to embrace my injury and make it part of my identity. I carried on collecting glass eyes for many years, always on the lookout for new designs or something different to what I already had. When I was 25, I discovered the dark web. A friend from my Dungeons and Dragons club told me about how he had used it to buy some sort of hallucinogenic. I didn't plan on using the dark web for anything like that. I was just intrigued by the idea of it. Once I was on, I started looking for stores. It was amazing and disgusting. People selling guns, drugs, services, and even other people. It made me feel a little bit ill knowing I was now a part of this strange, illicit world. I went on to one store page, which called itself Mr. Bubbles Objects of Trouble, which was the first store I had come across which had a search bar, so I thought, fuck it, let's see if they have any. I typed in the words glass eye, I didn't expect anything to come up, and I was rather surprised when a match popped up on my screen. The item was called The Sight of Sin, which was simply a black eye with a small red number 7 on it. It pulled at my fancy, so I decided to buy it. I didn't truly expect it to show up, but one week later a package arrived and there it was. As customary with all my new eyes, I washed the eye in a solution to make sure it was clean. When washed, I put it in a case with the rest of my eyes and went back to watching television. The next morning, when I woke up, I thought I'd test out the new eye to see if it was a good fit to check how comfortable it was. It went in with ease and felt absolutely perfect, so I decided to leave it in for the rest of the day. Nothing strange happened at first. It was just my usual daily routine of having breakfast and doing some work on my laptop, but then the doorbell rang. As I opened the door, I immediately knew something wasn't right. 
I had double vision all of a sudden. There was only one man standing on my front doorstep trying to sell me solar panels, but I could see him twice. One image of him was completely ordinary, just the bloke dressed in a suit holding a brochure and telling me about how he can save me money on my electricity bill. But the other image, well, it was him, but dressed up in a gimp suit cracking a whip against the floor lustfully. I don't think I said a word to him, I just stared transfixed by what I was seeing. Eventually, I closed the door and stood there for a moment trying to understand what had just happened. I passed it off at the time as just my mind playing tricks on me and that I must be overtired. I decided to have a nap. I was woken by a telephone call from my father asking if I was still coming to his house for dinner. I looked at the time and realized I was running late, so I grabbed my coat and flew out the door. On my way to my father's house, which is just a 10-minute walk down the road from mine, I walked past just one person, a lady, walking her dog, but again I was seeing double. In one image, she was completely ordinary, apart from being overweight. She was wearing a pink coat, and beside her, a dog trotted along minding its own business. But in another part of my vision, I could see her again, completely naked, eating tin dog food with a fork. Jellied meat dripped down onto her breasts, which she licked ravenously. I was almost sick. I thought about just going home and going back to bed, still trying to convince myself I was simply tired from working. But my father missed not having me at home, and I didn't want to let him down. Though now I wish I did. Now, what happened next won't make much sense unless I explain something. When I was two years old, my mother died. I say died, she was killed whilst walking home from work one night on this very estate. Nobody has ever been caught in relation to her murder, but now I know exactly who took my mother from me. My father opened the door with a large grin on his face. Come in, son, he said cheerily, but I did not move. Besides, the image of my father standing in the doorway was another vision of him holding a knife and laying beneath him on the floor was my mother, soaked in blood, eyes vacant and still. I took a step back from my father and did not stop running until I had reached the front door of my house. Straight away, I went onto the dark web and searched for Mr. Bubbles' store, but it had gone, vanished like it had never been there. I didn't leave the house for a few days. I didn't answer the door. I didn't even pick up the phone. What I did was sit by the window looking out onto the street, watching the people walking past. I think I know what I am seeing now. It makes little sense, but it's the only thing I can think of which almost explains what I am seeing. Firstly, when I remove the glass eye, I no longer see two images of everyone. I only see one just like I always have. But when the eye is in, I see two visions of every person I look at in the flesh. Secondly, I think I know what I am seeing. I am seeing their sins. I know, that sounds utterly mad, but it's the only thing all this seems to point to. The name of the glass eye, the red number seven, and the grotesque and disturbing images I see. I believe it's their sins I am seeing with my new eye. I see the true hideous nature of people, the part of themselves they hide from everyone else. I know I could just take the eye out and forget about it, but I just can't bring myself to do this. I can't trust anybody without it. I can't see the real them. But seeing people's darkest secrets also leaves me alone, for once you see the hidden nature of someone, you never want to be close to them again. Many questions remain. Why does this eye allow me to see these things? Who made it? How did it end up on the dark web? I need to know the answer to these questions. So please, if anyone out there has any information on the eye, or if anyone has ever come across Mr. Bubbles' Objects of Trouble store, then please get in touch. Please. During my first year of college, I was introduced to the Tor browser by my new roommate, Ricky. Those of you who have been around the internet for long enough know Tor as a browser engine used to help you access the dark web, to which we frequently did. 
for a barely 20-year-old dude experiencing his first moments of living away from home, being handed away to access nearly whatever I wanted just from the press of a few keys felt like being handed absolute freedom. While we mostly just used it for accessing pirated games and films, or maybe visiting a banned website, there were times I found myself on the more twisted side of it all. Now, I've honestly seen some pretty fucked shit that I really didn't want or need to see other than to satisfy my morbid curiosity of if it would be possible to even reach those places. While I mostly regret these deeper dives into the dark web, one such dive might have very well saved my life. It was about 2 a.m. on a Friday during the end of my third year of college and Ricky had been spending the night at a cousin's house, leaving me to myself. I had been scrolling through the web, going through various shady movie sites and running games I didn't technically own when I got a strange pop-up ad. One-time auction, limited items, one of a kind, get now or never again, don't miss out on these items. It read in a flashing red and green Pomic Sans font. Now I've gone to a few of these dark web auctions, even participated in a few out of impulse bidding on things that triggered something in my dumb college dude brain. This ranged from things like overly engraved gold handguns you would see Tony Montana strapping, to pounds of the finest weed grown in the purest soils of Jamaica, just to give me that little adrenaline rush of, dude, what if I actually get it? Granted, I only bid 10, maybe 20 bucks tops, knowing actually winning any of it would probably land me behind bars. I wasn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed and would have been busted within minutes of receiving the package. This one would be different, however. I decided I'd check out the auction and click the link before browsing through the bids. At first, it wasn't anything serious, mostly firearms and drugs, typical black web catalog. As I moved down the list, the items got more extreme, much more extreme. The list started with simple low-caliber handguns you could get at Walmart in some states, but quickly changed to sniper rifles and LMGs fit for military elites, till I was eventually being offered small nuclear explosives claiming to have enough power to level small towns to ash and brimstone. Super strong pot and funny mushrooms quickly turned to advertisements for pounds of Colombian cocaine to 10 pound boxes of fentanyl pills. Shadiest of all were what I assume are experimental drugs. Black and yellow sludge like substances held in test tubes that didn't even have real names, just things like XT exclamation point one inch and B8 plus RVV1 slash. Judging by the descriptions, these things fry your brain considering the people selling it explain the effects through mostly incoherent, barely understandable sentences, implying they've been indulging on their own supply. I remember one going along the lines of fun green bubbles when super cool if eaten, you it's like green green blue green bubbles, they fly fly, eat up, fly down with the green bubbles. I might be paraphrasing on that, but trust me, it wouldn't have made any more sense than if I did get it spot on. Eventually, I reached what I took to be the hitman and murderer catalog. Poison brews of ryzen and cyanide claiming to have zero scent or taste, soundproof sneakers, weapon silencers, fake aliases, passports. People were even selling codes that were apparently instructions on how to get to areas in your location where bodies are most often hidden and never found. There were other codes that were labeled as how-to instructional tapes made by professionals on how to get away with various types of murder to even murderers. If you didn't want to do the work yourself, you could buy the phone number to a top-class hitman near you who will make sure your job is done effectively. Things only got worse when I scrolled to the next page to see photos of people, some even children, with their names listed underneath. They were advertising human trafficking and given each of their product a small biography of sorts as if they were stat cards. It listed everything from address to allergies, strengths, weaknesses, even down to the daily routine. 
Now, I've seen these kinds of black room type things and was well aware of how sick people can be on the dark web, but seeing it never got any less unsettling. Especially reading some of the things these bidders wanted to do with the product once they got their hands on them. This unsettlement quickly turned to unimaginable, agonizing fear as I scrolled down to see my own portrait, one taken on my first day of college. I began to panic as I read off my card. Whoever these people were, they knew my name, age, race, height, weight, even down to the small birthmark behind my ear. Not only that, but they seemed to have known my whole life story from birth. My panic only grew wider as I saw there were already four bidders, the highest of which bidding almost 15 grand. The sickest part was these bidders left comments, things like, He'd fit well with my collection. I can't wait to have his body. I wish to taste his skin. Along with a slew of horrible, deranged shit they wanted to do with me that I, I really don't want to repeat. I fell back and began to hyperventilate. It felt my heart was going to give out and my brain was going to explode thinking of all the horrible things that may happen to me at the hands of these sick, twisted people who look to take ownership of my life. Most of the rest of the night was a blur. I remember bidding 20k off the bat to top the list, then periodically bidding I think another 3 what I felt like every 30 minutes till I reached almost 40k. After that, I must have blacked out because the next thing I remember was waking up curled into a ball under my desk in a puddle of cold sweat. It was still dark out, so the flashing lights coming from my monitor were all too noticeable. I could feel myself shaking in fear as I slowly crawled out from under the desk before slowly looking at my screen and seeing in large red comic sans, congratulations, you win, please list where you'd like to send your prize, we will send an agent to deliver your package. I felt an overwhelming amount of relief wash over my body seeing I had just bought myself. Sure, I ended up putting myself in near debt before I even finished school, but I'm alive and free. Knowing those vile fucks wouldn't be able to live out their fantasies was enough for me to forget about any possible money problems. Think I even started laughing like a madman for a second as I entered Leave Them Be. I bought them their freedom so they don't suffer. Hoping that'd be enough explanation, and thankfully it was as I answered rather quickly with another message. Understood, your product will be removed from all auctions and marked as sold. Thank you for your purchase, Evan. Reading that caused me to nearly collapse as if all the stress and tension built up drained from my body, only to quickly return as I reread the message. They knew I just bid on myself. They were still fucking watching. The next couple months were a living hell of paranoia and anxiety. I tried to explain what I could to Ricky, and he did his best to help calm me down, but it was fruitless. Eventually, though, after enough time, I was able to move on from it. More so, I think my mind forced me to block it out, but it's all come back now thanks to an email I had just received from Ricky almost eight years after that night. Please help. I don't have the money to go up against the highest bidder. I responded as quickly as possible, asking for him to send me his PayPal or something. That was two days ago. I haven't gotten a response. I think he lost the auction. My name's Paul, and I own a dark web courier business. It's not big, and I usually don't take in people I don't know. It's usually the same old customers and almost never new ones. I take my customers' privacy very seriously, therefore I don't know much about them. The reason why I'm writing this is because something happened yesterday, and I'm not sure what to do. So this brings me to my story. I'll start this story with the only logical place, the beginning. I've always been curious, and I've been a little introverted since I started school. Not sure why it just happened to be. Due to my introvert nature, I didn't have many friends in school, so I usually just browse the web. Though I started to get bored of the regular old clear web, Sure, it did help with the small itch, but when the time started to pass, it just didn't do the trick. That's when I learned about Tor. The gateway to the unknown, is how I like to see it. 
Now I'm sure everyone has heard about the dark web and the stories surrounding them. Some of them are true, but most of them are just bullshit. If you see the dark web as the Walmart of drugs, firearms, and hitman services, you'd be right. But it's much, much more than that. Actually, most of it is pretty basic and regular old forums talking to people that can type anything they'd like. It's an uncensored part of the clear web. This is where my story began, with the forums. After you've been on NNTP Chan for a while, you start to learn your way around the block. So for those of you who don't know, NNTP Chan is a forum of sorts. You can find the answer to basically any question in existence. This is where I met my first customer. Let's call this guy Jack. So, Jack. He's one of the regulars and I don't know much about him. All I know is that he too owns a business here on the web. I have no idea what this guy does or anything about it. All I know is that I deliver his packages here in my hometown. I take them, deliver them to their respective addresses, and be on with it. I pick up the packages at random dead drop locations. I drop them off and get paid through crypto. I'm getting ahead of myself now. Let's start over. So, Jack. I met him on NNTP Chan. He messaged me after a post I made about working in the local area and asked me if I was searching for work. I mean, I was skeptical about him, but what do you expect from me? Anyway, I told him what I did. Next thing I know, he messaged me a link to a website. This website was... weird. No, unusual. This website was all black with an address written in the middle of the screen with the text, the handicapped toilet under the sink. I looked for it quickly before the website got shut down. Next thing I know is the sound of a message coming from Jack. One o'clock, Friday. Don't be late. You'll know where to go when you pick up the package. My first thought was, what the fuck have I gotten into? But I did need the money. I've had troubles with money and as a poor student, a little extra cash on the side couldn't hurt. So long story short, I did as asked. On Friday, I went to the address, which I've decided not to include due to the privacy of my customers. Anyway, the address that I went to was an old gas station at the edge of my small town, and just as Jack had said it, the package was under the sink in the handicapped toilet. It wasn't that big, it was a small envelope with a wax seal on it. Almost exactly like those you can see in movies or in the library. On my way out, a man grabbed my arm and told me a new address. Go to 33A. Ask for Mr. Williams and tell him that the sun's up today, shining splendidly over the lake. Then he just let my arm go and walked into the handicapped bathroom. I was a bit stunned at this, but I didn't think much of it. So I did as instructed and biked over to the address given to me from the man in the gas station and knocked on the door. A large man with a long lumberjack type beard and a face filled with acne scars opened the door. I mean, this man was huge, like probably like six foot four or maybe six foot five even. It took me a while to grasp the man's appearance before I finally said in a trembling and a little awkward voice, Um, I'm looking for Mr. Williams. Is he here, possibly? The huge lumberjack-looking guy stared into my soul for what felt like minutes before he turned around and called out for a guy named Joe. Not his real name, but I will do. Joe, there's some punk here to see you, he muttered. A few seconds later, a slim, fairly average height man came to the door and looked at me. Mr. Williams, I presume? I said I was trying to sound confident. The man just nodded at me. The sun's up today, shining splendidly over the lake. I said with a bit of unease in my voice while holding out the envelope I had taken from the gas station. The man in front of me, Mr. Williams, looked at me for a few seconds before responding. Surely, it is a splendid day to take a swim. Before I could react, he snatched the envelope and shut the door on me. I must add that I was a bit confused by what just happened, but I learned later how that came, but that's another story for later. I quickly returned to my bike and biked home. When I came home, I saw that I had an unread message on NNTP Chan. It was Jack, as I suspected. The message read as follows. Well done. The payment has been submitted to your past data crypto address. I will be in touch if you're interested in working some more. Before I could answer, I had a new payment on my crypto vault and there it was. A payment of 350 euros. 
Holy shit, I said silently to myself. I know what you're thinking. Only 350 euros? Well, shut up. For me at this time, it was huge. I was a poor student, so leave me alone. So now that we have established my financial supremacy, we can continue. Jokes aside, I was poor, and I needed the cash. Let's leave it like that. I quickly sent a message back to Jack. Fuck yeah, man. I'll take everything. Looking back at it now, I kind of regret that statement. For an example, do you understand how fucking hard it is to clean up after some weird liquid that dripped from the pallet the other day? Or, or that time when I had the police search my whole storage facility due to some suspicious marks on one of the boxes I received a few days before? So I told the officers that they can't search my premises without a warrant and probable cause. So the officers turned around and never came back. As I have stated before, I take my customers' privacy extremely serious. Now I don't usually ask what's in the package if it's not something that's in need of special attention, and if so, I don't ask what's in them. Rather, I ask what special care it needs. I try to refrain from knowing too much. Those damn cops aren't going to get anything out of me. Anyway, I continued working for Jack. He's, well, one of the regulars. He always wants something delivered on Fridays each week, never to the same house or block, always in different parts of the town. The only consistent thing is that it's always that same looking envelope, that pale white one with the red wax stamp. I try not to think about it, but I'm certainly curious about what's inside of it. I'll get back to all of you some other day. I have a lot more to tell you about my work, but right now it's Friday and I got a delivery to make. You guessed it, it's from Jack as always, but this time it's not an envelope like before. It's a pearl white box with the writing, To the man who supplies. I'm not sure what that means, and I'm not sure if I want to. Something is telling me that it's not my business, but I'm a curious one. Always have been.